you've raised it. And I'd forgotten how surprising that is. Ban the wearing of abayas in school. The way that women are used, we if we are very good to look at, mm. then we are stripped of our dignity. Today, you've got teachers who see it as their duty to proselytize, to convert Muslim kids. That event was where the first time I'd really experienced segregation of the genders. Being a thinking person by the grace of Allah, I thought to myself, oh my God, I think I'm a misogynist. It's no exaggeration to say that in their quest to malign Islam, some in the West target Muslim women. Her position within the family, her place in society, and of course her dress are placed under the microscope. And like colonialists in the days of empire, her emancipation is seen to be a means to a greater Islamic reformation. In recent days, France's Minister of Education has announced that abayas, the loose dress many Muslims wear for modesty, will be banned from schools. Apparently a piece of clothing is an affront to French secularism, and yet again another sign of separatism. In the UK, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson likened burqa-wearing Muslim women as those that chose to look like letterboxes and bank robbers. Young Muslim women are subject to a barrage of what can only be called propaganda, traducing their religious dress and promising to liberate them from their religion. Now, to help us understand how this works and to caution against some of the extremes by which the community can handle this onslaught, I am delighted here on The Thinking Muslim to invite the writer and activist Lauren Booth. Lauren Booth is a broadcaster turned activist and author. She is known for her principled activism on Palestine and regularly comments on Muslim affairs. Uh, and she is also the author of this memoir, In Search of the Holy Land, which is available on Amazon and all good bookshops, I think. In fact, Lauren, I'm amazed that you've got a recommendation here from Nikki Campbell, a fascinating read. I couldn't put it down. I mean, Nikki Campbell often is characterized as someone who doesn't really have a good word to say about Islam and Muslim women. How did you How did you get that? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah Thanks very much for inviting me. I've wanted to come on the Thinking Muslim podcast for quite a number of years now. I really enjoy your content and your interviews. Okay. Uh, Nikki Campbell, yeah, that was, uh, you've raised it and I'd forgotten how surprising that is and how it started. So about five years ago, we were having a spat on Twitter because he had said something so obnoxious that, that I just had to really pull him up about it. We'd worked together previously, Radio 5, we'd got on well in my former incarnation uh, as a non-Muslim uh, broadcaster. And what, he what did he say? He said on Twitter, right? He said, um, I would, uh, it was about the burqa not being allowed in France. And it was, you know, really, we, we knew that a ban towards hijab, ban towards the veil, all of these things were coming up in France. And he said, I would rather my 15-year-old daughter went mostly nude on a beach that she covered up like that. And I'm sure he used something like looked like a letterbox or but it was really obnoxious. Mm. And so a lot of Muslims underneath had commented and I just put out on my on my feed, look, that is out of order. It's a disgraceful thing to say. It's awful on your daughter. It's um, Islamophobic. It causes all kinds of problems. You have no idea about this and you actually have no right to put your foot into this. And I said, everybody who agrees with me, bombard Nikki Campbell right now. Mm. Within the hour... His Twitter feed had almost crashed <laughs> with furious Muslims just, uh, you know, really going at it and saying, take this down, take this down. So he got in touch with me in the DMs and he said, Lauren, I'm being harassed online because of you. I said, no, Nikki, you're being harassed online because of your obnoxious views. Mm. He said, OK, that's as may be. Could you call off your attack dogs? I <laughs> said, don't call my people dogs. Yeah. And uh, but what I might do. Oh, no, then he said something. He said, I thought Islam was about being polite. And I'm like, oh, dang. <laughs> He's pulled the be nice card and what would the prophet do? Yes. So I said, you know what? If you're feeling harassed, I will ask people to tone it down. But you and I need to talk. So we got into a discussion and I tried to make him see, talked about the hijab and he asked some really good questions. He said, can you advise me? And it led to... When my book came out, I said, Nikki, I feel you should read this. As a friend, we've come to a kind of a very warm impasse. Um, 
and I'd like to send it to you. And he read it and I said, he loved it. And I said, I'm going to use your review on the front. Is that okay? He said, Lauren, go for it. Wow. Huh? So it just shows that people don't like to think of themselves. Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what? I'm really going to annoy people today. I'm really going to pour hatred out there. Not if they're in any way ethically, morally not bankrupt. Um, and they have half a mind, you know, f for, for what words mean. They want to be talked around. So let's engage. That's my message. Now, I provocatively use the word onslaught against the Muslim women or against womanhood in mm. my introduction. And I suspect many may dispute this as hyperbole. Um, how do you assess the current discourse surrounding Muslim women? Well, I look up, first and foremost, we, we, we use our own experiences as jumping off points. Mm. And I know for certain that there are arenas where I am and my views, legitimate, well-informed, journalistic views, have no space anymore because I dress as a Muslim. Really? Yeah. So I used to work part-time for the BBC. I used to do reports on Sky News. I mean, the, the, the newspaper reviews, etc. Yeah. And when I put on the hijab, that ended overnight. Wow. That, that's not a coincidence. And that is the experience, more importantly, yeah. of women across Europe. There is something that the European Union um, and their, uh, the parliament there in a report has ex accepted and acknowledged. It's called the triple bind. So if you're a Muslim woman in Europe, mm. you've got your degree and you want to go into the workplace, mm. you have these three factors against you. One, you're a woman anyway. Mm -hmm. Two, you're in hijab. And three, if you have a Muslim name. And that means that that's three, pretty much three strikes and you're out. And that is a real difficulty. It's a real prejudice. And uh, that's what we've been facing for a long time. Recently, we're talking in a week where the French Ministry of, Ju of, of Education uh, has banned the abayas uh, in schools or banned the wearing of abayas in school. Um, and that follows, you know, a series of bans, the ban of the face veil in, in France and on streets as a fine for someone who was a, a face fail. In fact, in fact, I remember they even passed a law which prohibited Muslim women from asking for a female doctor. Potentially, they would get a, a, a fine if they requested a female doctor. Uh, so there is this obsession. And of course, in France, there's a ban on the hijab as well in, in public buildings. So there is this obsession with women's dress in France and across Europe. What lays, what lays behind, what lies behind rather these, this obsession? You know what, I'm going to agree with that, but I'm actually yeah. going to extend it to a socially unwell uh, society. Right. Because I was on a plane uh, yesterday coming from Istanbul. Uh, we were waiting for our plane, actually. Everything had been backed up. And I got into a conversation with uh, a woman who lives in France. And she said, and I was saying exactly what you're saying. What is this obsession with women's dress? She said, hey, it goes deeper than that. She, her friend had taken her six-year-old son to a swimming pool mm. and he had long shorts on. Yeah. And they said, no, you can't come in. Wow. Why not? Because you have to wear Speedos. And she said, are you seriously saying that my six-year-old should be in budgie smugglers? Yes. Don't even think about what that means. Yeah. Um, and that's an obsession with a sexualization of the human body yeah, and a minimal amount of dress so that everybody is accessible to everyone else. So on the one hand, if you're French, uh, sorry, if you're Muslim and you're living in France, you know it's about being Muslim. But if you're a, a French person who wants a different level of modesty, you also know that there is a catchment area where you are different from the rest of the society. Mm. So there's a sickness that, that really causes that society to focus on the Muslims there. But it goes deep into every arena. I mean, to me, France is a failed state. It's a failing culture. When you actually have to put a gun to a woman who is modestly dressed on a beach and tell her, take your clothes off, you've lost your mind. And when you're telling children, little boys, you can only wear a strip of material like this or not come swimming, you are really in an unhealthy situation. 
Now, the online space and, and generally popular culture is a very confusing place, I think, mm. for Muslim girls or young Muslim mm. women in particular. Um, and um, you know, I've got a daughter and I, I think that uh, unlike maybe my son, she is impacted by a barrage of confusing messages about her Muslimness, about her hijab, about the obligations of mm. wearing certain types of dress. Um, and it, it just seems to me that there is this deliberate attempt to target Muslim girls in particular and to, uh, dare I say, to try to, read, try to make them move off the path of, of Islam. I mean, am I exaggerating this? It, what, what's, your, what's your perspective on this matter? Can I ask how old your daughter is? She's now 20. So she's, she's 20 yeah, now. Yeah. So she's made her decisions, but all of that time, probably from the age of about eight, she will have been really hyper aware of being different in the public space, Very different much. at school, yeah. spoken about, not spoken to, yeah. othered. All of those things are, are, are really dynamic and drive a lot of girls into saying, I can't do this. Most mothers of Muslim girls say in the UK right now specifically, they will meet, meet a point when one of their daughters will say to them in hijab, perhaps at 13, I don't know if I can do it tomorrow. Mm. I, I just want a day off. And at that point, you realize that, that society is social engineering the Muslim community by um, criminalizing the young men. There are more new laws in the last 20 years focusing on young Muslim men yeah. and Muslim areas to make men less successful, boys less successful. You know, Muslims are dire in education. And yet we can get 34, a 16-year-old Muslim girl got 34 GCSEs at A. Mm. And the young men, you know, don't worry about them. Let them fail. The, uh, the pots of gold that go to Birmingham are for secularized Muslim women women's groups, by the way. Yeah. So you have that big draw. If I want to be successful, the Muslim, the Muslim women's groups that the government likes yeah. are all led by non-hijabi women. And are not diverse. Mm. And we've been saying this for a long time. Come on, let us be represented even in our own communities. So I would say, actually, brother, that's it's gone so far into making us insecure that you're beginning to see workspaces run by Muslims. And I've had this specifically with um, a convert sister who was sacked. Or no, she was told by um, the Asian men she worked for who were Muslims, don't wear black all the time it really puts off the customers mm. she's a convert to islam trying to be modest in her way and learning her faith yes told by muslim bosses the way you look is putting off white customers right i mean where do you go with that right and and why why, why? i mean what you're you're intimating that there is a an atmosphere that has been created deliberately created to uh shoehorn to push Muslim women in a particular direction. I mean, can mm. you speak to that? What, why is this atmosphere being created? I think it's, a, it's clearly an insecurity in our society about the strength of what our culture is. And when I say our, I say all of us as British people, right? You know, when you go abroad and mm. you're like, well, what is Britishness? Yeah. This has been something the conservatives have wanted to ask us for the last 20 years. What does it mean doing British? There's been lots of uh, jokes about it. I mean, for me, when I was 20, you know what it meant? It meant ska music, mm. bacon sandwiches, mm. Auzu Bilair, mm. and um, uh, yeah, Notting Hill Carnival. Right. That, that was Britishness. Now, right. to my grandparents, that would be, apart from the bacon sandwiches, an absolute anathema, right? Yes. So that uh, what is being British doesn't allow yet for a diversity of experiences. Yeah. And that's making everybody insecure. I mean, you've got Rishi Sunak, who has agreed to have a, an immigrant holding ship on the Thames in order to, to, to go along this anti-diversity, this fear of foreigners movement. I mean... That, that, that really speaks to an insecure environment, doesn't it? Yeah. Let me ask you about the hijab in particular, because, of course, back, back to, you know, my, my daughter. I mean, mm. when she was growing up, she had conflicting messages from everywhere about the hijab to the degree that you had 
what seemed like people who were being very much sponsored by central government or at least sponsored by NGOs that were linked to separate central government mm. discouraging her from wearing the hijab. There's a lot of noise out there about what is the appropriate, what is the correct Muslim dress. Now, of course, I know that some Muslim women find it very difficult to wear the hijab. And, you know, that's not what I'm speaking to here. But I also know that there is just general confusion that probably has never been in Islamic history. I suspect in most of Islamic history, Muslim women generally knew, okay, this is the the requirements of, of Islamic dress. Um, how does a Muslim girl navigate this noise that seems to be out there, which is discouraging her from worshipping Allah? The first thing we have to do is to really look at who we are following. Mm. So each of us has our own individual timeline. Have you ever been shown some somebody in your family has said, oh, here's my Instagram feed? And you're like, that is weird. <laughs> what is that? It's like going into somewhere really strange. Some Sometimes uh, my, my husband will log in to his account for some reason on my laptop and I'll end up going through his feed for half an hour of going, why is it in Arabic? Why is it so weird? And go, oh, God, I'm literally trolling my husband. It's so different. So their worlds are very, very different. So number one, you have to look at who are you following? Is it hypersensualized pop stars? Is it uh, jokers on Instagram? Is it women who cover? And where are you taking your faith from? So none of us can legitimately say that we're going to be, as women, taking our faith from a woman who looks like she's in the Barbie film. <laughs> All right? That would be like, okay. Harun Yahya tried it a few years ago. Yes. That, that uh, strange cult leader in Turkey. Yes. He, he surrounded himself with blonde women, hypersexualized, yeah. and said, this is the dean. And everyone went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You've lost your mind. Yes. So if you're a young woman, and you're saying, right, on the one hand, I might like this pop music and I like these shows on Netflix and that, right? That's just social culture. But when you come to the Dean, you're not going to go to Netflix, right? Because you know that, that that's outside our Dean. So when you put in, here's a little thing you can try. I'm saying this straight to your daughter and, and young women out there. Put into Google, female Muslim scholar, mm. not influencer, not celebrity or personality, okay? We're talking about people who teach the actual deep and the basics, the building blocks of our Islamic deen. Yeah. None of them will be uncovered. Now, if these women know the prophetic model and the Quranic model of expectations, and they're paid and endorsed to teach this by the, the, the ummah, by the ulama, then surely that's enough for me. I'm a very simple person. I have to be honest. Mm. I don't need complexities. Mm. I do something simple like that. And I say, you know, your dean, you're teaching me and you're all covered. Then that tells me all I need to know. Great. Yeah. That's a very, very good sound piece of advice, I think. Um, there is a uh, an argument or a discussion that seems to have gained currency in recent months and maybe even recent years about um, reinterpreting the Islamic text yeah. according to uh, according to modern standards. And one such strand of discussion is that maybe some of the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah alayhi, may Allah reward reward them immensely for for their efforts and and their struggles. Maybe some of the Sahaba had, in inverted commas, a misogynistic mindset. And so when they conveyed hadith, they conveniently conveyed some hadith which would uh, today be regarded as misogynistic. For example, I don't know, hadith that, that places, you know, the man's responsibility to be at the head of the household, for example. Is that misogynistic or is that common sense? Well, so I they... I call that misogynistic. Actually. Yeah. I mean, so, they, you know, I remember there was a, a Twitter, and again, Twitter isn't the real world, and I think that's what, you're, what you said in the previous answer. But yeah. in, in one Twitter discussion, there was some discussion about Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, mm -hmm. being someone who was, you know, uh, misogynistic in, in the sense that he conveyed some hadith which the particular person disliked. I mean, how would you 
uh, address this, sort of reinterpreting Islam from the modern lens? Look, the, fir the first thing to note is there has definitely been a deliberate collaboration mm. of a certain type of hadith telling people how to behave in uh, interpersonal relationships between men and women. Mm. And it's Salafi publishing. Mm. And it has been very successful in the last 35 years in telling us one version, one very harsh, basically unlivable, I would say, yeah. to, a, to a degree, version of what it is to be a man and a woman in a marriage, a marital and a housing relation, you know, a family relationship. Yeah. So there's been that editing. Most of us don't have the Arabic, the, the, the thick, the Sharia knowledge to delve into these matters. Mm. Who uh, would I be right now to give my, even if I praised it with, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. um, on, the, on these very deep matters? I follow teachers. And each one of us, each of us needs to find a teacher. Mm -hmm. And above all, our connection to Allah Ta'ala, our prayers, our salah, our dhikr, this is our connection to the truth of the deen. Mm. Um, going and doing some search and saying it's all rubbish because I've seen the light. I had a man come up to me, funnily enough. A lot, a lot happened in the last two days at Istanbul Airport, apparently. Yeah. He came up to me and he said, oh, uh, you're a convert to Islam. I know some truths about uh, the Quran. And I said, oh, he's a, I said, where are you from? He said, I'm Iraqi. I said, oh, are you a sheikh? He said, well, it depends what you mean by sheikh. I said, well, a sheikh is someone who who learned from someone who learned from someone who learned from someone who learned from the, um, the prophet, peace be upon him. He said, oh, I know more than them. I said, then you're very arrogant. Yes. He said, well, I, I, I'm walking away from this. I said, please do, yes. right? So I think we need humility and I think we need guides. What do you think about the current... I know you live in Istanbul and maybe you've been immune to what's been going on in the West in the last probably couple of years. Uh, and it's a discussion about womanhood and discuss about gender and it's discussion about trans uh, women and, and their status in society. And again, that's one of the complexities that we've found we've had to navigate around as Muslim parents, as, as just Muslims in this community. Like mm. how, you know, of course we are minorities and we, we have to somewhat navigate lots of complexities and challenges and as you, I think, said in an earlier answer, it is. It sometimes is a very. It's a very. It takes a lot of bandwidth to be a Muslim in the West. You've got to. There's so much on the road, and you've got to just think about lots of things. But anyway, this this issue about womanhood has has come along, mm. and it's a difficult subject to broach. I mean, how would you, how would you approach uh, what's going on here in the West in recent years? You know what? First of all, I'd like to say. I, I, I'm still a journalist and I'm married to a journalist. So mm. if only we were out of this awful, you know, right. the stuff that you're hearing, the question being asked, what is a woman? And people say, well, it's someone who thinks that they might be and can be if they choose, would be to wear, no, not to wear, but, oh my goodness me. Yes. It, you know, a, adult female human is quite a simple answer to come to really. Mm. Um we're looking at the erasure of women. There's no doubt about the it. The erasure of women. The erasure of That's women. That's quite a hard statement. You know, mm -hmm. explain that. What, what do you mean? Okay, that? well, I'm going to go back to the fact that, a, first of all, let's start with women who are aging, all right? I've worked, I worked, in, I worked in TV for 30 years now. And uh, about around, since the last 20 years, a host of TV presenters from the BBC have complained about this. Female mm. presenters over the age of 40 saying, hang on, I was the head of three current affairs show, suddenly I was ditched. And the BBC has had to pay out record damages to a number of women uh, because this society, not the Muslim society, mm. but this secular society judges women based on their appeal. I just got off a plane. How many times am I mentioning planes today? Mm. Uh, I think I'm still in the airport. Yeah. I was, uh, for, for our viewers, you were stuck in Istanbul, <laughs> Istanbul for two days, two was it? Two days, yeah. Allah, yes. <laughs> it obviously had an impact on me. But I was the way that women are used, we, if we are very good to look at, hmm. then we are stripped of our dignity and put on posters next to a water bottle going, buy this, it's pure. 
you know, and, and it's filthy and it's horrible. And I had to look for like, you know, four hours at this. And eventually I took it out. It was on the seat back and just turned it round. And there was a man sitting next to me. I said, do you mind if I just take that out and turn it round? Because <laughs> I did not want to look at a, a naked woman. So we're very visual as women mm. in British society and mm -hmm. European society mm -hmm. if we're attractive and near naked. If you're aging, you can feel already redundant, ignored. I live in Istanbul. The women there are increasingly having duck lips, terrible amounts of Botox. Mm. They're looking ill. And so along with asking what is a woman, how should we look is an obsession to everybody in the society. Right. And so when we have the guts and the serenity and the sheer unbridled guts to say, I'm not showing you anything today. Mm. Oh yeah, and you won't be seeing me tomorrow either. You're just gonna get my face. And what I say, <laughs> that is such a powerful statement. Right. So your 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 argument is that the hijab, in a way, it it liberates women in in, in a sense, but it it um, uh, makes them into less of a uh, a sex object, uh, you know, a someone that should be admired for their beauty, and that's it. To someone who. Uh, one needs to engage with on an intelligent level, but again, the counter argument to that by many in the West would be, well, where do where does that exist? I mean, you live in Istanbul. Are women in hijab treated, you know, in in that way, that idealistic way that you present? Well, hang Islam? on a second. I, I'll give you a couple of examples. I I where I I lived in uh, Qatar in 2015, yes. and the first time I went there, I remember being. Uh, you know, you go to the airport and there's the the woman's line. And I was taken out by uh, the, the soldier and he goes, uh, or the, the, the customs officer, mm -hmm. he goes, oh, over here, madam. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody there. And I walk through like royalty and I'm like, okay. And all the men are queuing over there. Yeah. And then I, I go shopping and I have my bags picked up and carried to the car. <laughs> and even now I go, I went to Qatar for the World Cup. And my husband, who's a lovely man, by the way, he always complains that when we go to Qatar, I expect to be treated like a queen afterwards because I see the women in the airport and I'm and they're they're just wafting along in black, <laughs> you know. And the, and their husbands or their sons uh, or other people are carrying things. And my husband he carries most things, but I still carry something. And I'm mm. like, take my bag, you know, because it does it elevates us and gives us a break. I, I, I there is a lot of beauty out there. Does this happen all the time in Turkey? No, but you know what? Hijabis have a superpower. Right. We have a superpower. I was told this by an Al by Albanian girls who don't wear hijab. Mm. They said, you know what? When we see you in the street, it's like you're gliding along mm. and we want and it's like you're surrounded by light and you have a superpower. Mm. And so as a hijabi wearing woman, you have that that extra meter of space. You're either beautifully invisible, because it's quite nice to be invisible in the street, or you're just, you know, you're left alone. Men don't press against you. Men, men stay back a bit. And that's a nice experience because I've had the other one. Right, I've right. been the woman in the, in the short, uh, there was, a, there was a BBC presenter who came to visit me after I accepted Islam. Yeah. She said, I can't believe you're the same Lauren that I met at the election party eight years ago. I said, oh, whatever I said, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. She said, I would describe you as the, the, the woman with the biggest mouth and the shorter skirt. I went, yeah, that would have been me, hmm. right? And no body space, no respect from the men. Um, it's very different in hijab. Mashallah. It's a oh. bonus. It's a bonus. So you live in Istanbul, and anecdotally, it hmm. seems to me that more and more Muslims have decided to leave the West hmm. and to move to Muslim countries like Qatar or to Kuwait or to Istanbul. I think in Istanbul, we've seen, you know, a probably, I, I mean, last time I was there, I saw a, a growth in a number of Westerners, Western Muslims who've decided to to live there. And, and most of them say they they just had enough of the uh, the criticisms they get in the West. Uh, they've had enough of the racism maybe they get or the Islamophobia, but also they fear for their kids. Mm. Um, it's now common for Muslims here to think about, if not moving to a different country, to think about pulling their kids uh, out of school, 
I mean, where do you stand on this discussion about how intense it's become in education and just general society towards Muslims? You know what? It's really interesting. For 10, 10 years, a friend of mine called Anissa, mm. she's an educator, mashallah. She has been raising the alert going, you don't know what's in the books. Really? She's been on these education groups that I'm on. She's like, mums, wake up. Ask to see the books on your kids' curriculum. What age? Not 11, not 10, 7 and 8. Mm. Ask to see them. Mm. And when you ask to see them, the teachers say you don't need to. Or now, increasingly, you can't see them mm. in case you, you protest. Um, because it is such disgusting content in children's books at schools that they cannot show it on the news. The same nightly news that shows dead bodies and bombs falling and explosions and horrendous things going on cannot show the books that are being given to our four and five year olds. This, interestingly, this is a sign of a failing society. There was a study done in 1936 by a, a, a British academic and he found the same trigger points for each failed civilization that he studied. Really? Yes, rise in androgyny, uh, lib not liberation of women, mm, I forget the word, but it's basically uh, no protection of the women, right? And um, the, the sexualization of society, a rise in homosexuality, all of these things are happening. It's a dire situation, and I totally understand Muslim families wanting to leave. It is. I, I, I thought about 10 years ago, actually, brother, that, and I still do, that if you really wanted to get the Muslims out of Europe yeah. and you couldn't kill them like the French did with the Algerians just 30 years ago and then threw their bodies or 40 years ago, threw them in the Seine, Aoudou Billah, um, that what you do is you just make it a little bit unlivable. Mm. A little bit unlivable. Let's say in France, you can't have halal meat at school. Why is that? No halal meat. You have to eat pork if you're at school mm. or go without. What if we, oh, I know, they don't like sex with outside marriage, the Muslims. Mm. How about we talk about that all the time? And how about we force, we, we say to their children, homosexuality is an option. And we, we do that at a young age. That, that is kind of social engineering. Now, I'm not saying this only affects the Muslim community. We're not paranoid. Mm. This is a devaluation of the human spirit across the spectrum. But it really is helping us leave. And I think it's a good leave. I think it's a good, a good thing. Really? We should, yeah, I think we should, we should leave the sinking ship and we should be building up our countries and uh, offering an alternative, which is what the Ottoman um, and the Al-Andalusian societies did was say, hey, come over here. We've got beauty here. We've got fairness here. We've got a way that you can move up the ranks in society. You're not trapped. And for that reason, Hundreds of thousands, millions perhaps of uh, Christians came and lived in our Muslim communities and the Jewish community thrived for centuries there. Um, I'm, I used to be an educator and I know that 20 years of the war on terror has in a way mm. radicalised the teaching profession. And today you've got teachers who see it as their duty to proselytise, to convert Muslim kids into good little liberals or, yeah. you know, or something like that. Um, you know, this type of fear, I think, that Muslims uh, face in, in this society is very palpable. Now, not everyone's going to be able to leave the country. You know, uh, we've got, what, two, three million Muslims in Britain. How, it's not going to be possible for yeah. those six million Muslims in France. Economic situation for majority of those Muslims in France would not enable them, allow them really to leave, even if they wanted to leave because of just the sheer amount of money that's required to move to somewhere like Turkey you need to have some some you know some some capital behind you i suppose so you know in or the a job you know or to a be job, fair or a job right so in the absence of of that um how does a muslim in this country still make it uh in these societies it's really tough <laughs> it, there's no quick fix is there yeah i mean you you live between here and, to, and istanbul too right yes. yeah um i i i left but people do have to be here and they have elders and the people, the families I know who don't want to move, usually don't want to move 
because they ha- they want to look after their parents and grandparents, mm. which is a beautiful duty. Yeah, yeah. And also, these are our roots. This is our home. These yeah. are our, our villages, towns and cities. Where do we go and start again? It's pretty scary. I don't think there's a quick fix to this. I, but I do think that we need to improve our Muslim schools. Yeah. I think if we do a good enough job that that the non-Muslims with an ounce of ethical grounding will actually want to come and be in our schools. Mm. Um, I don't know if I don't know enough about the education here to say, can you fight? Um, can you argue with the Department of Education about what children see now? Um, and, and they're coming for homeschooling as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's very true. Um, can I turn to a, a broader question about how you perceive gender relations in Islam? There's a, there's a raging debate, and again, it's usually online, about whether what is the role of the men and women in the family? Mm. What's the role of men and women mm. in society? And of course, there are some who have a very liberal interpretation and some who have an interpretation which makes it impossible for those families to function. But I'm, I'm just talking about, I want to know about, you know, the, the average, how do uh, normal Muslims view this? Um, let's, let's first consider the idea of patriarchy, which is, of course, a, a buzzword uh, in the West. Can we describe the Islamic faith to be a patriarchal faith because of the way uh, Islam views the father as the as the uh, authority figure in the family and the responsible person and the person who has to provide, you know, for the maintenance of the entire household. Uh, that, for me, sounds like a very patriarchal uh, uh, idea. But you know, the, the the connotations attached to patriarchy, of course, are, are very negative. So, how would you navigate that term, patriarchy? I think our our idea of patriarchy really um, culturally goes back to the Victorians, mm. because there the 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 man in certainly middle class and upper class society had absolute dominion over the women. Right, property rights, property everything. inheritance. Right. You married, you went from your father's house to your husband's house, and you could carry none of that wealth with well, you. Yeah, right. And if you if you if your father died and you inherited a great amount of land, it was your husband's, and he could do with it what you what what he liked. Spend it, drink it, give it give it away. Yeah. And so that is a terrifying prospect. And I think really, as Westerners, as Europeans, we as British people, we're traumatized by that. The women, we're traumatized by this legacy. We're traumatized by the fact that there there was no protection from the heavy drinking, from the beatings. Um, that that we couldn't escape because we had no money, and this is not the Islamic. This is not the Muslim experience. Mm. Look at Khadija radiallahu an. She had inherited wealth from uh, her husbands. She had built an empire that she could keep after marriage. Mm. We have always had this, um, and yet we're supposed to look at Islam through the lens of Victorian patriarchy. And superimpose then hyper femini- fe- fem- um, feminism on top of it. Reject all of that. Mm. We don't want anything to so do with that. We start again. We, we start with a blank again. sheet. So yeah. then, it- yeah. And also, where where, where is the pa- does Allah Taala say this is a patriarchal religion? Women are lesser. No, mm. these mm. interpretations were, were were never what was understood. Right. You know, the ma- the woman is a cover for the man. The man is a cover for the woman. Yeah. The man has uh, one one over on the woman. But what does that mean? What does it mean? He's got um, duties that are really, really heavy and beautiful. Mm. And actually, you know, me and my husband speak about this a lot mm. because uh, he's, 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 he's studied, alhamdulillah, he's got ijazah in, in fiqh. And yes. it's it's... A man thrives with the weight of caring for people. Mm. And a woman thrives with that care being lifted and being looked after. No point is one pressuring or destroying or saying to the other change, but growing together and thriving. You know, I, I want to say to my young sisters, you're talking to someone who for 30 years as an adult lived the ultimate in feminism. Mm. I worked. I worked since I was sixteen. I was hugely successful at the age of thirty. I earned more than my husband. 
Um, no one could tell me what to do. I was entirely liberated from any man. Mm -hmm. And what did that look like? Well, I'm telling you, you have your time of the month. You're tired. There's nobody showing you sympathy because, hey, I don't need your sympathy. I've, if you said I don't need your sympathy a hundred times, don't expect on day 101 mm. to go, I'm in pain. Well, you said you didn't need sympathy, mm. right? I, did, I carried my own bags. When I was pregnant, no man was carrying my bags. I had, a, I had some really horrible experiences during pregnancy. I remember once, um, and I hope you keep this in because it's really telling about, about vulner, vulnerable moments that women have, okay? Because we need to accept our vulnerability. I was eight months pregnant. I was showing off how, how I could carry my eight months pregnancy and still be at the Labour Party conference. And it was one o'clock in the morning because I wasn't going to go home early just because I'm pregnant. And I started to have really bad pains. I mean, like stabbing pains. And so I was sitting on a Brighton pavement in the rain at one in the morning waiting for a taxi. And the taxi came and two young men from Blair's government, by the way, jumped in, jumped into the taxi. And I went, wait, I'm waiting as well. And they're like, yeah, whatever. And, and I said, but can't you let me go in? And then one of them said, he was 20 years old, why? I said, because I'm pregnant. He said, well, it's not my baby, is it? Is that really the society that we want? Is that really the liberty and egalitarian equality that we're fighting for? Don't be fooled. Um, I want to give another example because, because this, this, this made me laugh. I was on an underground train a couple of years ago and I saw a young black sister and she was looking like she was absolutely going to faint. I don't know whether she was ill or just ha had been, been working hard. And she was exhausted standing up. And next to me was a young man and he looked Asian. I just love being an auntie. That's something else, by the way. <laughs> you know, Islam gives you a status to grow into. Yes. I can be as an ignore, annoying and bossy and people are like, oh, it's auntie. Leave auntie alone. It's wonderful. You know, you have that space. Anyway, yes. the young man next to me, young Asian guy, and I said, excuse me, brother, are you Muslim? He said, yes, I am. I said, then get out of that chair and let the Muslim sister sit down. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, okay, auntie. Do you yeah. know what she did? Right. No, I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> I said, you're going to sit down and you're about to have a three-stop lecture from me about how to enable men to look after you. <laughs> yeah, because we're not enabling our men any longer to be the carers. And, and that makes them bitter and frigid and more likely to say, I don't want to care for you. You don't deserve it. You're this, you're that. Leads leading to these these schisms yeah. and illnesses. And and I just wanted to end on that point of the patriarchy. Islam, Allah to Allah sees believers yes. and cares about piety. That's very clear from all of the texts. There isn't a male female divide. Um, you know, it's not men in this line. Oh yeah, you get fast track to Jannah. Show me that tract. Mm -hmm. Show me where it says that doesn't alhamdulillah you know the patient ones the sabarin the kind ones the good ones the ones who give charity the ones who pray to their lord the ones that that's that's our parameters not the patriarchy there's a interesting point you made there about the friction that exists in wider society and the spillover into the muslim community i've noticed and again this may be uh, and we don't have to talk about him in particular but the andrew tate effect where there is this extreme response to hyperfeminism and the response is this machoism where with it comes this attitude that all women are bad i mean i think it's it's maybe a response may not be a response but there is a, an associated um uh feeling amongst women that all men are bad all men are evil mm. and that doesn't lead to very good relations between men and women um we've noticed and again you know you've been out of the country from for, for a while, but we've noticed in this last year or two that the Andrew Tate type of ideas have started to develop currency amongst young men and young Muslim men. And some of it may be, may be positive, you know, given them, you know, but a lot of it actually is a, an un-Islamic uh, way of viewing women. I mean, how have you come across this? And, and, and it's a confusing world for young men as well as young women, I suspect. Listen, I, you know, be right on the cutting edge of it with a daughter at university. You have young men saying, 
I get to dominate you. I mean, it's really, it's like seven-year-olds going, eh, I don't like boys, eh, I don't like girls. Yeah. You know, I don't like you because I, uh, you're less than me and I don't like you because you smell. It's pathetic and it really is damaging uh, the, the relations between the genders um, for our young Muslims, subhanAllah. You know, you've got, you've got an environment where a young man can, and I've heard this twice recently, in two potential marriages, there were two engagements, and uh, both times the young men said, I have the right to check your emails and your phone. Wow, really? Yeah. And the family of the young women went hell to the no, mm-hmm. because, because that is psychologically controlling behavior. Yes. And it's unhealthy. But these sort of you know noises off, if you like, these surround sound, um, I'm not going to even name them. Mm. The, these these people on social media, these men on social media who have their own toxic problems and their own, you know, lack of spirituality. It's a lack of spirituality from the brothers to 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 look at themselves and to say, "Am I? Be, how am I being beautiful? How am I being kind? How am I going to bring kindness into this?" Chivalrous. That's leadership. Yeah. That is leadership. Yeah. Being chivalrous is leadership. And on the other side, yes, we have a fractured um, um, and um, what's it when it's um, it's not frigid, it's um, easily breakable version of a female femininity where they're afraid of the men. Mm. And then that makes us more likely to run to the safety of the office, the safety of having our own money, mm. the safety of a life without a family, because I'm afraid of you. And we all need to get breach that gap. Mm. We were all, all of us, uh, you know, the, the learned people, the ones who are, who are uh, you know, role models or speakers, however you want to, to call our, us elders, we need to, to bridge that gap and say, come on, guys, speak to each other. Let's, because I think it's hyper, hyper-individualism right. is, is an issue here. Right. So to explain that hyper individualism, it's that yeah. it's about my rights uh, and about my response, my obligate, and that's it. That's all that counts. Yeah. You've. I mean, you know. I mean, we think so. A lot of the brothers, the young brothers, are saying feminism, and everything that a woman wants is now feminism. Mm. She's the kind of woman who wants two dresses, not one. Feminist. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. She's the kind of woman who would like to have her own keys to the door, feminine. No, what? Everything is called feminist now. Yes. And it's such a a derogatory term. That's true. Isn't it? Yeah. It's just bandied about for normative behaviors. Yeah. Uh, Jazakar, I think that's uh, that's interesting. I I suspect there needs to be more effort, probably from uh, Islamic scholars or Muslim role models, to, to address this subject in a more... Uh, rational way, in a more sensible way, probably. Sure. Um, I know Imam Dawood Walid has written a book on Islamic chivalry, Muslim chivalry, nice. and he gives classes mm. to young men as to mm. how they should, you know, how they should respond to women and what should be their response. And brittle was the word, word brittle, I was thinking right. of. To, to my young sisters, I'd say, don't be brittle. Mm. Okay? If, if a young man says, can I take your chair? Say, thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you cared for. It makes you a part of that society. I'm a big one for going to events. And at the end, the sisters always want to gather the chairs. I'm like, no, you don't move anything. Brothers, get in there. Let's use those muscles that you're buffing up at the gym. Yes. Come and do something useful. You know, we need to give each other spaces. And um, when I said hyper-individualism, what did I mean? I meant, there's a, there, like you said, there's a selfishness. Mm. If you are a young sister and you want to go into marriage and you're like, but I'm not going to cook and I ain't going to do this. And well, what is the point of marriage? You just want a flat chair basically (laughs) with somebody paying your bills. No one's going to buy into that. It's not fair and it's not nice. It's not kind. Just be kind to each other. Why can't people just be normal? Can I, can I ask you a, a a couple of political questions? I know a lot of your, your book uh, does discuss um, your politics prior to becoming Muslim and Mm. how you, you changed um, not only socially and change in, in terms of your spiritual attitude, but also your political understanding. And um, the Iraq war uh, is, is, I think, a, a, a key milestone in your political journey and just how duplicitous maybe the British political elite were, and, and in particular the Labour Party were, 
in taking Britain to war. I mean, again, you're from a from someone who now lives a lot of the year outside of the country. Has any of that improved? Do you feel that British politics has moved on since that disastrous Iraq war decision? Well, you know, it's, this book really tracks a, 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 a spiritual and a political journey of a person who wanted to have beliefs but not do anything about it and then was forced by as many were by the iraq war to wake up in 2003 when i went on that march i was breastfeeding one baby pushing another in a in a pram it was minus three degrees if people were there you they'll remember snowing and sleeting and i told my three-year-old it's not meant to be fun kids like you are dying Okay, which could sound kind of harsh on a three-year-old walking in the snow. But, you know, if you believe in something, you have to put yourself out there. Don't be an armchair anything. And what I saw on that march was amazing. There There were women from Middle England who told me, I've never been on a march before, you know, dear, but this isn't right what's happening you know, shock and awe, is that what we're about now? My grand, my, my father fought in the war and it wasn't about killing civilians. All right, so we had this idea of decency. Yeah. And what the Iraq war did was it wrecked our version of ourselves as British people. Right. This was before you became Muslim. This was before. Ah. Yeah. yeah, and I, I actually, um, I met Yusuf Chambers because of my activity there. Yeah. And um, we... He's the lawyer, Muslim the lawyer, lawyer, convert. Yes, sorry. Continue. Yeah, yeah. And um, he invited me to, to give a speech at uh, an event for Iraqi war widows and um, orphans. And I bring it up because that, that event was where the first time I'd really experienced segregation of the genders right. in my life. Yes. So I was speaking on the stage and then Yusuf said, and then I saw all the cool guys sitting over there and the sheikhs and uh, Kat Stevens, Yusuf um, Islam, Islam was yes. there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I'll be sitting over there. And Yusuf went, no, no, the women are over here. And I went, mm. yeah. I'm really like a sulky child. Mm. And I, being a thinking person by the grace of Allah, I thought to myself, oh my God, I think I'm a misogynist because I don't like women. <laughs> I don't want to say... And not apart from that, all the racist racism thoughts that I was having, like, oh God, going to be talking about biryani and kids. How ri-? I mean, these were all things yeah, sure. that, that yeah. we can ignore or actually pick out in ourselves. But yes. and Islam is a very reflective, mashallah, um, uh, you know, uh, spiritual way of life. So, yes. so I picked up on those anyway. I, I went to the table, and there was the first niqabi I'd ever spoken to. Right. So she's sitting opposite the table and I thought, I'll just be nice and engage her, poor thing, Mm. you know, Mm. a little bit about kitchen stuff. I said, so what do you do? And I fully expected to say, I've got seven kids Mm. and I'm a third wife. And she said, oh, I'm studying civil civil engineering (laughs) um, at the University of X, Y, and Z in my fourth year. You know, I got a first in this and da, 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 da. And I'm leading my class and I was like, oh, right. (laughs) And she wiped the floor with me. Mm. Intellectually, she just, she, she got the mop. She put me in there and she wiped the floor with me. And I loved it because I thought, good on you. And what she said to me, coming right back and circling back to the beginning of our discussion, what does modesty mean to her? She said she used to be, when she first started university, to fit in, she was in a T-shirt and jeans. And um, she noticed the men looking at her. And when she got up, she might... She, she knew there was an uptick in the scoring because, mm. because people liked her presentation because she was pretty. Mm. And she said, then I started getting closer to my dean and I wanted to, to take away those triggers and protect myself from my Lord, my family. And now I have to work not twice as hard, exponentially hard in my presentations because I have nothing here. Mm. But my words are good enough for me to be the head of that class. I'm like, boy, mm. I got it. <laughs> I think that's the moment I got modesty and that's the moment I started to like women. Can I ask you about uh, your book, your biography, your memoir, mm. In Search of a Holy Land? I, I read uh, a really uh, fascinating section in the book about your, uh, your experience. I mean, you were someone who was very much in favour of Tony Blair. Of course, he's a rel- relative of yours. I mean, our viewers would know that he's married to your sister and you were very much someone who was within the, the labor mode and you supported new labor as the alternative to 
uh, to you know to conservatism, which was of course you know horrid in in the 1990s. Oh, it's horrid now, and it's still horrid. Yeah. That's true. That's very true. Uh, but then there was a change in in your view of labour, and the Iraq War, of course, as you've just discussed, you know, comes into that. But uh, you know, I found it a fascinating read, and and um, in a way, it allowed me to understand how someone who was a non-Muslim viewed those years. Because from a Muslim mm-hmm. perspective, you know, I saw it very much as a war on terror. This is a, a prime minister who's getting close to Bush. And, you know, it, it, it's it's amazing. Every day there was something on TV about Muslims. And every other day, Tony Blair was announcing an anti-terror law. And, you know, I just felt that Muslims were under siege during that period. So mm-hmm. it was fascinating to see from your perspective, but just from a broader sense. I mean, what lay behind? Why did you write this book, your memoir? I I wrote this for somebody like myself in my 20s who got a sense that, that this isn't it. This table, this mug, this world isn't it. The material world, that there's something more uh, out there but couldn't put my finger on it. And many of the, the, the people that we meet, they're exploring Buddhism and they're going through the tick boxes. Right. Even veganism is almost like a religious cult now. You're cleansing your body to get closer to some amorphous being, right? But the minute, but what is the access point to a spirituality that leads to God? I mm-hmm. wanted to, to give that access point and also to run through the, the, the differences in the culture, the things that have been happening over the last 25 years, who were we and who are we now? And there's so much in there as well about traveling to Muslim lands and to accepting my own innate prejudices as well. I hope I've done it in a humorous way. Um, I think people do tell me that, yes, I laughed my way through it and I cried my way through it. But that honesty about what I thought about Muslims, then you meet them. And then you you suddenly find yourself in a mosque, waking up, going, "Oh my God, God is Allah," and this guy Muhammad, I I, th- I kind of think he's the last prophet. What do you do with that? Mm. And so it takes us on that journey. And I really wanted to to do that for people like me in my twenties. But I think more than ever, my readers are Muslims, young Muslims, asking themselves, "I don't know why I'm I'm I I don't know why I'm Muslim." I'm Muslim by heritage, but I don't know how to ask the questions and I don't know how to come over this hump if I can make it in modernity as a Muslim. Right. Mm. It answers those questions, inshallah, in, what, in, 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 one, in, in one way from a Western perspective to an Eastern perspective, from a, from a Christian to a Muslim. Can I ask you one last question about Palestine? Now, you've been an advocate for Palestinian rights for a very long time and... Um, you know, it's often quite perplexing to just see how Israel is treated in a very double, you know, it's, it's become now common to say that there is a hypocrisy, there's double standards. And Israel is, is treated in a completely different way than any other country in the world. It can get away with anything, really. And, and there will not be a uproar in the British press or in the American press or the European press. How do you understand this indefensible support for Israel in the West? I don't think they're getting it all their own way anymore. Right. It's changing, isn't it? Since, uh, you know, just in the little time span when I've been an observer and uh, uh, the other good thing, by the way, much better thing is that the Palestinians now have their own voice. Social media has allowed people like me to step back. You know, you don't need my voice now. Mm. Maybe you never did. Maybe it was white savior. Wallahu alam. I just, you know, we saw something and we wanted to reflect upon it with the world. Yeah. So there's a Palestinian voices now um, of pain, of brilliance, of cleverness, of resistance, and they're being heard. So that's number one. And the second thing is, I think the exceptionalism is falling apart. Alhamdulillah, studies have shown that uh, young Christians in America, which is, which is really Israel's capital state of support, uh, are now more likely to support the Palestinian cause than be Zionists. And, and that's huge. Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago in Australia, is it the government who said they're going to be referring to the occupant? They're not going to be calling it the occupied West Bank. They're going to be calling it Palestine now. That for the Zionists is like 
the stab in the heart. So yes, there is still political exceptionalism. And unfortunately, it looks going to take many more deaths and much more pain, probably, for that to change. But it is changing. Alhamdulillah. You know, never give up. Never give up. Allah sees all. They, they want to destroy Allah. So Allah, you know, Allah, Allah is with the believers. And the world is waking up. So I, I actually feel much more positive than I did at the start of my personal experience with the quest, this question in 2005. Sister Lauren Booth, Jazakallah Khair for your time today. It's been fascinating. Absolute pleasure. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkingmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah Khair.